Once more, darkness falls upon the city. You wake up, same as you have these past few nights, in a window this room. As you pry open the reinforced steel door, you look out the window to see, invariably, a sky bereft of sunlight. And then it hits you. The hunger. For a moment, you let yourself wonder if there will ever come a night when it's just not there. Given what you've learned thus far, you probably have as much uh, chance of kickstarting your heart with jumper cables. You lock the apartment behind you and head over to Sophie's apartment. You did promise to call on her. Might as well not keep a lady waiting. Hey, what else are you gonna do? Call M? She's probably worried. I mean, she, she will be when she actually tries to give you a call, which might not happen for a few more weeks. Months, if she's busy doing press for a new piece. You could try to track down your sire, if the sheriff hasn't done that already. After all, he did buy your painting. There has to be a money trail, right? But even if so, what would you say to him? These thoughts put you in a weird mood. It's a strange sensation to walk the crowded streets, same as you have so many times before, but feeling so disconnected. All these people, you're not one of them. Not anymore. You're a vampire, a kindred, and you need to carve your own path in this strange new existence one way or another. Appropriately enough, you arrive at Sophie's building, just as that thought crosses your mind. A quick word with a security guard and you're led into the elevator. Apparently, Miss Langley is expecting you. Of course she is. Why, why are you saying it like that? You were literally told she was expecting you last night. You're a fool. You're a buffoon. You knock and wait, patiently, as the footsteps on the other side grow closer. Finally, the door opens, and Gregory, Sophie's driver, invites you in. You find the lady herself standing by the window, silhouetted against the city's midnight glow. She stares out, motionless, like a marble statue. Is everything alright? She doesn't react immediately, but seems to snap out of some meditative state and look at you with strangely bleary eyes. Yes, it is. How kind of you to ask. Tell me. When you look at this city... When you see the lights, hear the hum, smell the rain on the pavement, what do you think about? You gaze out. You thought the city couldn't surprise you anymore. You've lived here all your life, after all. But tonight, something feels different. You realize in this moment that you have truly changed. Yes, you know what Sophie means. The way she gazed out the window and saw the truth beyond, you do the same. The view is fascinating. Every detail absorbing. Every angle a new experience. The familiar made sublime. When you turn to Sophie again, she smiles at you knowingly. Ah, so you understand. I had my doubts. But perhaps we are of shared lineage after all. You see, the blood that flows within me is that of Clan Toreador. There are thirteen such bloodlines among us kindred. Though that number is contested in the past. In these nights, it seems that nothing is certain anymore. The clans have gone by many epithets over the years. But the names used these nights have their roots in medieval times. The original Inquisition, if you can believe it. They use these to categorize us, describe our inherent differences. In time, we adopted them ourselves. Each clan has a uniqueness about it, inescapable, originating from an ancient progenitor carried from sire to child. Where the Toyador, the gift lies in a sensitivity of sorts. We are uniquely attuned to beauty and ugliness both. We can see where most cannot. A blessing on most nights. Occasionally a curse. 
The sheriff of some of my clan as well. Oh, he's Toriador. Eh, right, well, throw that nonsense about him being Banu Akim out the window. Although you'd be hard pressed to see him as such. Poor dear. It breaks my heart to see him in this state. Still, there was a beauty to it as well. Nothing like a good fall from grace. Try as she might to act playful, you could tell she genuinely cares. She lets her gaze wander for a brief moment, but is quick to regain her composure. Then there are the Vontru, known for their pride and a proclivity to rule over others. The prince represents that clan, got that right? And is quite common in our society around the globe. And the blue bloods think themselves rulers. The Bruja call them like to see themselves as preeminent revolutionaries. They call for universal rebellion while being slaves of their own temper. We don't discuss the matter much anymore. Not after they have largely broken off with the Camarilla. To think they were philosophers once, long ago. I hope to tell you more about some of the other bloodlines tonight. Say I meet a vampire for the first time. How can I tell what their plan is? Usually you cannot. With a few exceptions, perhaps. For some clans, the uniqueness I mentioned bleeds into their appearance or disposition. But even that can be misleading. Outside of a few very specific cases, knowing one's clan is less important than understanding who they are personally. What drives them, their wants and needs, weaknesses too. Speaking of which, we come to the reason I wanted to speak to you tonight. It is customary in our society, especially among young kindred, to organize into coteries. Sometimes these are called by the prince themselves, or mandated by a fledgling sire. In our case, you may treat it as more of a strong recommendation. I want you to seek out companions. Not only because you need to learn more about our society, but also because it is useful. True friendships are rare among kindred, but having allies, even temporary ones, is something of a necessity these nights. We might be selfish creatures, but we are drawn to each other nonetheless. Yeah, that's, this is an interesting question, but I don't think it's the first thing that would jump to Lamar's mind. Any suggestions on where I should start looking? I was just about to get to that. She puts on a mysterious smile. I spent some of my precious time last night asking around, pondering potential kindred for you to meet. Came up with a short list of contacts. I hope you'll appreciate the gesture. Forging a partnership with them might offer perspectives and viewpoints that I cannot provide. Lenses with which to view are kind. They are all members of the Camarilla, of course. More or less. Thanks, I guess. I know this might feel awkward, but trust me, it's the easiest way. You'll find you still have much to learn, and it's the best if you have many tutors. So, let us start with the Tremere. They are a powerful clan, disliked by many, but feared and respected by many more. They have been an important pillar of the Camarilla since the very beginning. They are blood sorcerers. Blood sorcerers. You could swear you once saw them at the Apollo. Probably not the same blood sorcerers, though. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, I'm just gonna say right now, I know the sheriff is a body with King, but I really hope they get acknowledged. I hope it's not just the uh, clans in the core book. Uh, ooh, what if they mentioned the, the Sombra? I know Chicago by Night hasn't come out yet, but that'd still be cool. Sophie Snickers. Oh, child. Don't be caught with that look on your face when you meet a warlock in person. They are adept at using Vitae, their own as well as others, to unique and potent effects. Since they are quite rigid in their hierarchy, the kindred I had in mind for you might need some persuading. His name is Agathon. From what I hear, he is quite the scholar. Very ambitious. A child of a noted Tremere here in New York. Eileen Sturbridge. Spend enough time with Agathon, and I'm sure you'll run into her sooner or later. This whole blood magic thing sounds intriguing. Oh yes, fascinating. It is also a well-kept secret of the Tremere. Don't expect them to share it right away. Some things have to be earned. 
Anyway, if you wish to contact the young Tremere, I hear you can usually find them in a New Age bookstore out on Broadway. The Tremere have one of their workshops there. Gregory will give you the details. Now, this next recommendation comes with a bit of a caveat. As you recall me saying, most bloodlines have unique features that might not be obvious at first glance. Well, there is one clan whose members wear their curse on their sleeve. Here they come. The Nosferatu. Ah, uh, there they are. Wait, Nosferatu? As in the German expression is classic? No way. No wonder they make their havens in the sewers, abandoned buildings and such. Their appearance is hideous and obviously supernatural. Had they walked the streets like other kindred, the kind would have learned of our existence long ago. Did she just shudder? It's hard to tell with her usual complexion, but you could swear her skin suddenly took on an even more sickly color. The one I have in mind isn't as big an eyesore as the worst of them, but he's no Adonis either. Still, he has some talents and connections that you might find useful. His name is D'Angelo, and he has an office, for lack of a better term, in the otherwise abandoned grain terminal in Red Hook, right next to one of those Swedish stores. The name escapes me, the ones with the awful furniture. Swedish furniture store? You mean Ikea? Yes, that's it. My mind struggles to retain things that are aesthetically displeasing. <laughs> Oh, she just, she, just, she just dissed Ikea. D'Angelo does odd jobs for Kadir, digging up dirt, locating Kitrid who prefer to remain hidden. The kind of work the Nosferatu are best at. He's on a case right now. Something to do with kind murders, I think. After your initial brush with our dear Sheriff, I I think it would be wise to show some, show, show some good will towards his agenda. I'm good at words. Assisting D'Angelo with his investigation might be just the thing. She takes a brief pause to look out the window again. Now come the two more exotic proposals. Exotic? As if the blood mage and vampire detective were business as usual. You may have heard about the Gangrel before. Uh, there they are. My favorite clan. My lads. My boys. Woo. I'm actually planning on getting a Gangrel tattoo at some point. I love them. You might have heard about the Gangrel before. They are a wild clan, in touch with their beasts in a way others might not dare to attempt. They mostly keep out of big cities, but there are exceptions. Nominally, they haven't been a part of the Camarilla for over two decades. But the one kindred I would like you to meet has, say, strong familial ties to the sect. Her name is Tamika. Her sire, Jezebel was instrumental during the Battle of New York back in 1999. The very same battle that cemented the city as Camarilla Domain. Sadly, her achievements have gone largely unrecognized. Tamika and a number of her siblings still reside in the, the domain they were awarded after the battle, Prospect Park. Jezebel herself left the city some years ago, fed up with being underappreciated. I got the impression contacting vampires who aren't the Camarilla was frowned upon. But you're saying these Gangrel aren't a part of the sect anymore. How does that work? It's not as clear cut. The Gangrel as a whole have sworn off the Camarilla, but individual kindred of that clan can still hold their ideals. Jezebel was one of them, before she became jaded. Besides, the domain in Prospect Park has been upheld by Princess Panhard for all these years, has it not? We consider them members of the sect, and they have, for the most part, kept to themselves. Perhaps it will take a young kindred such as yourself to make them realize where their loyalties lie. So, you see, seeking out Tamika could prove quite educational, if nothing else. And who knows, perhaps she will find her temperament a welcome change of pace. But speaking of change of pace, I have one last suggestion for you. Though it's one I don't make likely. The kindred who calls herself Hope. She's a Malkavian. They're a uniquely cursed clan. For centuries we considered them mad, insane, unhinged. 
but those of us who spend enough time with them come to understand the truth. It is no sickness, but a unique perception of the world that is them appear to us as unstable, and that perception can prove to be very valuable. Having a Malkavian as your companion might be taxing on the nerves, and your true test of patience at times, but their insight and intuition are unrivaled among kindred. As for Hope specifically, she is said to be a recluse, but I have an good authority that she can currently be found in an internet cafe, I believe it's called, in the one Manhattan. Gregory has the address. An internet cafe. Really? How quaint. I really wouldn't know. But since you brought it up, be aware that the Camarilla is highly critical of using the internet to communicate. The Second Inquisition made sure of that. Exercise caution when at her haven. Well, I believe that's all of them. I still have a few social calls to make tonight, so I'll leave you to it. Use tonight and tomorrow. No. And tomorrow night to arrange some cordial visits of your own. I will send Gregory for you as soon as I have further need of your services. Oh, that reminds me. You will need a car. Join us downstairs, will you? She smiles once more and turns to her driver. He helps her put on her coat, and the three of you leave Sophie's apartment. Sophie points to one of the cars near the building as Gregory hands you the keys. It's a rather inconspicuous compact car. A decent looking, if not luxurious ride. Stay safe, Lamar. This is your first night alone. Do not let it be your last. As they drive away, you find yourself with more freedom than you've had for the past few nights. A blessing or a burden. Time will tell. With a list of addresses in hand, you consider your next move. Ooh, okay. So, here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, got my bag of dice here. Alright, I got a die. It's D12. So, uh, one, two, three. Uh, we have, uh, one, two, three, we have this guy. Uh, four, five, six, we have her. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I'm going to roll, and we will see the results. <laughs> that's a 7, and I already forgot who that's connected to. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So tonight, we're going to go speak to D'Angelo. A recent strings of, string of violent killings has the Red Hook District of Brooklyn on edge. Sophie mentioned that Kadir al Azme has a, a secret associate investigating the murders, a Nosferatu neonate by the name of D'Angelo. If you help him out, he might be persuaded to form a lasting relationship. Let's roll. As you make your way down Clinton Street, the incessant hum of traffic gives way to the ominous silence of the waterfront. You stop to take in the familiar bouquet of the Hudson made all the more potent by your recently sharpened senses. Across the basin, the Red Hook Grain Terminal rears its rusty frame. Once a bustling industrial area, now a sleeping giant splayed out on the riverbank, forgotten, abandoned. Conven conveniently so, especially for one of the hidden. Keeping to the shadows, you sneak closer to the dilapidated complex making your way past whole ridden silos and wobbly chain-link fences. By the time you reach the entrance to the main building, you can almost feel the rust particles making themselves cozy at the back of your throat. Not getting your hopes up, you give the door a slight nudge. To your surprise, it gives almost instantly. Looks like someone's been using it recently. Once inside, you find yourself in a large empty hall. Looking around, you can almost picture it back in its heyday, stacked head to rafters with heavy machinery. You notice a set of stairs leading up to a mezzanine, most likely an office space. And then you see it, a faint light coming from one of the upper rooms. Looks like you're in luck. Quietly, with bated breath, 
You climb the steps and approach the dimly lit room. The door creaks open, revealing what looks like an old-timey detective's office, complete, complete with crooked window blinds, an overflowing ashtray, and papers scattered across a wooden desk. I know exactly what he's going to sound like. Suddenly, it hits you. That nagging feeling is all too convenient, too inviting. Before you can react, the trap is already sprung. A plume of cigar smoke wafts over your shoulder. The barrel of a gun rubs against your spine. A raspy voice whispers in your ear. Let me guess. You took a wrong turn at the third silo. Uh, presents, why not? Driven by a strange hunch, hunch, you open your mouth. You hear yourself talking, but the words are not yours. They seem to be coming from the deepest recesses of your memory. A movie you saw as a child. You don't know why, but it seems oddly appropriate. I know what you're thinking. This punk ain't got nothing on me. I'm sitting pretty on a loaded cult detective special. Five in the cylinder, one in the chamber. And I only need the one. As corny as it all sounds, the stranger seems oddly receptive to the tough guy monologue, so you bump it up a notch. Focusing your will, you boost your aura, filling the room with your presence. Your voice becomes smooth, oozing with charisma, a regular Sam Spade. You yourself can help but feel a sense of awe. Hopefully, the stranger feels it too. But then there's that nagging feeling. What if there's more to this guy than he lets on? What if he's got me right where he wants me? Maybe I should hear what he has to say. Is that right? Yeah. So how about we drop the tough guy act and talk like adults? You can always shoot me once we're done here. For a few tense seconds, the room go grows quiet. So quiet, in fact. You could swear you can actually hear the smoke swirling in the air. Finally, the stranger speaks again. You got a point there, kid. At a strange interplay of light and shadow, the stranger reappears behind his desk. Seeing him in his full, for lack of a better word, glory, you can't help but smirk. This is the dreaded Nosferatu. The way Sophie described him, you were expecting some grotesque monstrosity. Well, this guy? The clothes, the swagger, the hard-boiled detective routine. It all comes across as a bad joke. Still, when it comes to appearance, his lineage is undeniable. From 30 feet away, he could probably pass for a bum with a nasty sting condition. From 5 feet away, he looks like it was something made to be seen from 30 feet away. I'm screen capping that. I want to send that to some friends. That's a great line. <laughs> he leans back in his chair, casually pointing his gun at you. So, what brings you to my humble office? I'm here about the Red Hook murders? Yeah, that nasty business. What's it got to do with me? A lot, apparently. At least Kadir seems to think so. His expression sours. Not a name you want to casually toss around, kid. But hey, I get it. You're not some random schmuck who wandered in there out the street. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. Name's D'Angelo. Jin to my friends. So you can call me D'Angelo. Who I work for is less important. What I'm working on, however, isn't going so well. I think you could use some help. He gives you a look that's dirty, even by Nosferatu standards. Well, ain't you clever. D'Angelo lowers his shades. For a second, he sits motionless with his eyes fixed on yours. Suddenly, he raises his gun, almost making you flinch. Almost. Then, he twirls it into his shoulder holster, and a flashy display that definitely looks like it was practiced. A lot in front of a mirror. You see the Nosferatu's lips move, but the quiet mumbling clearly isn't meant for your ears. Listening in, you're able to catch snippets of his monologue. Sure, they seem to care. What was the end game? 
What was the angle? Everybody's got one. Even if they pretend like they don't. Especially then. What the hell? Maybe this town finally got to me. He pauses. Sticks a fresh cigar between his crooked teeth. Maybe a good leap of faith is just what the doctor ordered. No, I'm not gonna harsh this man's vibe. He's monologuing to himself. I do that too. I'm doing it right now. In front of a camera. You let him mumble on, listening intently. Maybe. Yes, maybe. I could use a healthy dose of unhealthy. Once more, he looks at you intently. As if your face was an active crime scene. Hey, speak for yourself, Nosferatu. He speaks again, this time in his normal voice. Tell you what, I was just about to head back to the crime scene. Take a look around, refresh my notes. You can tag along if you wanna. I could use an assistant. Someone to take notes and make wild assumptions for me to shoot down. Who knows? If you're any good, I might consider making this a long-term arrangement. Sounds good? Sure it does, kid. I'm the one who said it. Just one more thing. You still got me at a disadvantage here. Seems like you've been doing some digging on me. But with you, I barely scratched the surface. You catch my drift? So answer me this. Who was it that sent you into my neck of the woods? In layman's terms, who do you work for? Sophie Langley. For the first time since you got here, the Nosferatu adopts a look of genuine surprise. His eyes wander for a moment, finally giving way to a crooked smile. So you're the one, huh? Flesh the tutorial with them spared. Yeah, that would make sense. Don't think she'd appreciate you throwing her name around. Thanks for being up front, kid. One blink is enough for you to miss D'Angelo vanishing from his chair. Just when you're about to look around, he reappears right next to you. Up close, his smile is even more unnerving. Alright, moonlight's burning. Let's get cracking. With a certain fascination, you watch D'Angelo stumble his way across West Brooklyn. Oddly animated, incessantly scratching his face and neck, stopping every once in a while for about a mumbling narration, he most certainly is a sight to behold. Still, he seems to be getting around okay, and you take particular note of the fact that he seems to be choosing the darker, less frequented streets. Definitely a method to his madness. Eventually, your leprous guide takes a sudden turn off of Van Brunt Street and into a particularly dingy alleyway. The torn pieces of yellow tape are a dead giveaway. This has to be the place. Well, here we are. Time for you to earn your stripes. This is where they found them. Drain dry, not a drop of blood in them. Before you ask, no, I didn't get to see the body. So I don't know if there were any bite marks. So, what can you tell me? You take a moment to examine the crime scene. Judging by the chalk outline on the pavement, the man was killed recently. Curiously, there doesn't appear to be a trace of blood or viscera. And you know the city's cleanup crew isn't that fast, or that thorough. Looking up, you notice a, a spray-painted sign on the wall. It reads, The Blood Speaks in big, crooked letters. You look to D'Angelo. The Nosferatu gives you an unsuspecting look. An expecting look. Did you say the victim was drained dry? Because I don't see a trace of blood anywhere. Good eye, kid. It's the details that count. Given that the murder was committed right here and the victim didn't make a sound, we can therefore conclude that... The killer was kindred. Bingo. Only a human, only a kindred could drain a human this quickly, this quietly. But not just any kindred. Take a look at that graffiti. What do you think it means? Seems... desperate. My thoughts exactly. It's as if someone wanted to get a message across. I was too scared to stick around and write the whole damn book. So we got the abridged version. Tell me. If you were to guess which clan would you say our killer belongs to? Wait. Aren't the Tremere known as blood sorcerers? This is probably some fucked up ritual of theirs. 
Warlocks do tend to get creepy at times, but they're not exactly the Manson family. It's not their style. I might be jumping to conclusions, but my money's on the thin plots. He pauses, spits out the mangled remains of a cigar. Shit. Looks like we're gonna have to pay Larson a visit. Why him? Gee, kid, I don't know, because he's a swell guy to talk to? Maybe because he's the thin blood primogen. I knew it. Gah. Ever since I heard that New York has a thin blood primogen. Ah, uh, that's. That's a really cool take. I actually uh, ran a game that had. Uh, not thin blood primogen, but a caitiff primogen. Yeah, I, th I just thought it was a cool idea, and so I'm super excited to see their take on it. Not sure if he knows who the kill is. We could probably make an educated guess. In any case, we'd be doing him a favor. Turns out he is violating the masquerade. It would put him in a hell of an awkward position. I mean, shitting upside down awkward. It's the kind of weakness the other primogen would love to exploit. His position in the council's bad as it is. He pauses for a moment and mumbles to himself. It was too quiet for you to make out. Finally, he lights up a fresh cigar. He takes a puff and lets the smoke escape through his crooked smile. Alright, kid. Let's get this over. Alright, I think that's actually a good place to end today, because I'm tired and it's getting late, but man. Ooh, this is intriguing so far. So we're finally actually getting more of a sense of some of the gameplay mechanics and uh, how the city works. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's because we're barely out of the tutorial, but hunger feels like it hasn't come up that much. Like I said, we're barely out of the tutorial, so I don't want to presume anything, but... Yeah, the, uh, I really like the groundwork they laid for the mechanics, and I can't wait for them to start coming up more. Uh, great characters is always wonderful writing. I love this game so far. And I hope you guys are all enjoying it. Uh, like I said, I recorded this a little bit after the first batch of episodes, so uh, yeah. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to start receiving like feedback before I record the next couple. Uh, if I can contain myself then, I love this game. Alright, uh, thank you all so much for watching. Beyond that, uh, if you like this video, don't forget there is a button for that. Please be sure to subscribe if you want to see more content from me. I do Let's Plays every weekday but Thursday. And uh, on uh, on Thursdays, I alternate between uh, Oof Troop, which is the uh, Curse of Strahd podcast I do with my good friend Gail. Uh, well, general RPGs, it's just Curse of Strahd is what we're doing right now. Uh, and I do lore videos and talk about tabletop games and sometimes musicals because I'm weird like that. Uh, so if you like any of that stuff, uh, like the videos, subscribe, comment on them, let me know what you think about them. I love hearing your feedback. Uh, and share the videos with your friends. Uh, and as always, chance rights. <laughs>